So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you and your family are safe and well. Uh, my name is Donna Miller, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Purse Power. Purse Power is working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. We believe that if women who make 80% of all purchasing decisions would choose to buy from the companies that support women, and we would do that in mass, and if we could create a funding stream for battered women's shelters in the process, that we could shatter glass ceilings and change lives. So we do this program every Friday at 10 Central. You can go to our website, pursepower.com, and see our upcoming speaker every Monday morning for every Friday's session. So we are taping the session today. And again, videos are on our website if you'd like to watch them. Um, we've gotten to know each other. So let me go ahead and introduce Nancy. Nancy, thank you so much for being here. I sure appreciate it. You're very You're amazing. Welcome. I've always been really impressed with you. Um, so Nancy and I uh, got to know each other through the Women Presidents Organization. We were both chapter chairs. And uh, Nancy, I just see you as an incredible business person. That's that's the way you always struck me. You really know your stuff and you play at a very senior level. And I'm just thrilled that you're on today. So thank you. Happy to be here. It's uh, you know exciting to talk about what entrepreneurs can do going through kind of the next phase of post COVID and still kind of figure out recessions and wars and also social events. So it's, uh, thank you for having me. Oh my God, it's a complicated time. I know just quickly for a bio here, you're an accomplished entrepreneur, you're a keynote speaker, you're a strategic facilitator, and you're brought in to talk with companies about company culture, retention, um, career development and leadership. And the big part, part of the reason why I wanted you here today is because I love the EOS system. Uh, based on the book Traction, and I wanted to hear more about that. So you do that as an implementer. Um, mm -hmm. You're also a certified talent optimizer and a certified facilitator. Um, and you also speak on issues related to building high performance team with an equity and inclusion lens, which of course is a really important component these days. So, all right, here we go. So uh, to begin, why don't you give us an idea of your background, tell us your backstory and yeah, how you arrived at this place in your life and career. Wow. Um my backstory it's always funny to think about you know and i'm going to start right in with this equity lens think about it. somebody says okay tell us your story and where we start our stories are always really significant to our identities and and reminiscent of a conversation that we just had as we were waiting to start so my backstory i always start with family um current i live in harlem we just moved here after kind of in post-covid um, I have two daughters and a wife and two dogs, both of who are service dogs for my um, hearing loss disability. So you might hear them in the background if somebody goes by because they're letting me know someone's at the door. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and i um, the first of four siblings, th four of us in three years, 10 months. And uh, great family. Parents are still alive in their 80s in retirement, making that adjustment into assisted living. And, uh, you know, I always ask people when I meet them for the first time, what's your unique, unique ability, your superpower? And mine's probably teaching. Um, I went to college, got my bachelor's, got my master's in education, taught high school at a, in a service school. Um, kids weren't going on to college. They were going to either voc vocational schools, what we called it then, or the military and then decided to get my law degree and practice law for 40 years while doing um, lots of work in and around women entrepreneurship. So that's kind of how I got here. Um, if you're a teacher, that means the thing that I focus on most is lifelong learning. And I am constantly looking for what's the next class, what's something that interests me. And that curiosity is what brings me probably here today to just talk about what does entrepreneurship mean? How do we move forward in this very still uncertain world, um, especially economically? And um, most of our work, um, my company is Flexibility, and we think of ourselves as a social impact firm focused on equity at work, which is why there's so much about talent and culture and, and things in my background. So that's the back story. I don't know where else do we want to go from there, but I'll let you lead me through. Okay. Okay. Well, sounds good. So it's the, the thing that I really want you to talk about is this whole entrepreneurial operating system. I mean, it has been a rough couple of years. Right. I'm trying to help people finish the year strong and get ready for 2023. And so could you please talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial operating system and the model? 
and how it can be used to help us finish strong and prepare for 2023. Fantastic. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully okay. that technology works and you should see <laughs> the black screen of get a grip on your business and investing 60 minutes together. And if we have that, we're ready to move forward. We're good. Yep. All right. So EOS is, you know, it's a system. It's an operating system, just like you could choose a PC or a Mac. And probably the number one thing we think about when we think about uh, the operating system and based on the book traction available just about everybody everywhere, you can go mm -hmm. buy it at your local bookstore, please, um, is really about process. It's about doing the same thing over and over and over again, wash, rinse, repeat. And what Gina Wickman did is put together a model, which you see on your screen, it has six key components, vision, people, data, issues, process, traction. And for entrepreneurs, um, it is a complete system. So you don't have to go buy stuff over here and buy stuff over there. But if you really looked at this in a way that will help you get your leadership team and ultimately your company 100% aligned on where you're going, which is the vision piece, and then the traction piece, which is at the bottom of the model, is how you're going to get there. And then each of these key components each have two tools. Um, and we'll go through them today. But really what this does is it forces teams to get laser focused, to really get open and honest with where they are. No more kind of, yeah, you know, there's this issue about being nice versus being kind in leadership right now. And can't be painfully polite anymore. You've got to identify where, where you, where your team, where your company is suffering and hold everybody accountable to make a change. So EOS, six key components. Um, each component has two tools. They're really, really simple and there's not really any magic bullet. I think most of our entrepreneurs who really adopt this system and start to build muscles around the key components, around the tools, find that they are healthy as a team, that they can be adept more quickly to change, which is really what entrepreneurs need to be able to do. They need to have that ability to pivot, to, to, to really see truth and do what's best for the company not just what's best for my ego or my salesperson's ego or one group, but really do that. And so when we come in and, and people who read the book, self-implement or hire an implementer like me, we come in and we actually teach this. But how we present it is kind of the opposite of how we teach it. So the EOS process really starts with what we call a 90 minute meeting where the entire leadership team comes together it's a 90 minute meeting. It's called that because it let, it lasts 90 minutes. And we just introduce some of these tools. It's very similar to the topics we'll be talking about today. Then we really start with accountability. We start with leadership skills, what it means to hit the ceiling, because adaptability is the constant thing. You have to keep reinventing. And whether it's Warren Buffett or Drucker or Phil, Jim Collins, I always say Phil, Phil Collins, and then music is in my head, but Jim Collins. <laughs> Um, uh, Michael Gerber, I'm sorry there aren't very more, more women involved, but we're seeing more people are writing books and really doing the research. What it really, again, comes down to is really identifying where are your issues, because leadership teams, everything that's great in the company for you're absolutely responsible for. When you start thinking about accountability and doing things, keeping your promises, saying them and doing them, all of a sudden, all the imperfections come to the surface. And sometimes that's shocking for a team. But we try to give them some team health objectives to really be able to start having this open, honest, vulnerable communication, which really starts to move the needle. And, and, we, and we think about EOS, if you think about it, it's always rolling up. Everything is connected, just like we're connected as a team. So... One of Gino's most famous quotes really is vision without traction is hallucination. Um, and it really is this vision, 100% of where you're going, traction, how you're going to get there. And what leadership teams have to do in the vision component is fill out this two page 
strategy document, it drives all the really big heavy hitter consultancies crazy. You can't possibly put a 10 year strategy in two pages. Well, you can. It isn't to the exclusion of doing all the other things, but it really comes down to kind of these eight questions. And the most important one around culture, around equity at work, around inclusion is your core values. Not the stuff that you put out to your customers, but the stuff that you live by, that you lean into, that often is really where you make the most difficult decisions. And so this first page is of the what we call VTO. It's actually the vision page talks about your core values, your core focus, your tenured target, your marketing strategy. This is where laser focus comes to comes into being. And then your three year picture. If they made a movie, if you're going to celebrate three years and you have your metrics. And then what does it feel like? How do people talk about you? How do they talk about the company? That's that vision piece. The second part of this two page strategy document is the traction side, which is here's the one year plan. These are the goals. And again, metrics, super important goals, one to seven, not more than seven. And so as people are moving into and you think about, OK, we had 10 year target. We know our target, our ideal target market. We have our three year picture. Now we're down to one year goal and we just keep narrowing. Anybody who's familiar with a sales funnel, we keep narrowing that funnel down to what basically comes into, what are you gonna do next week? What are you gonna do tomorrow? And all of this is built around this idea of a rocket boost of activity rather than a hockey stick. Cause you still get the project done, but rocket boost, you have time and you have people helping you and you can think about it and rewrite it and redo it. If you're doing hockey stick, procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. Oh yeah, I got two weeks to get it done. It'll be good work. But the question is, is it your best work? Mm -hmm. So when your plan, the company commits to this, rocks are your 90-day world. And that probably is the most important piece of the EOS system. We know that if you're a neuroscience geek like me, we know that we're good to stay on track for somewhere between 40 and 60 days. That's, that's pretty good. And especially if you go with that rocket boost of activity at the beginning, get really excited, get a couple of the easy stuff, things out of the way, and then maybe you put it on the shelf for a little bit because the world happens, work happens, family happens, life happens. Rocks are a way of keeping your commitment. It's how we start to build accountability. And we say in 90 days, I will have completed these rocks for this quarter, Q1, Q2, new rocks, Q3, new rocks, and they're all driving towards that one year plan which is driving through towards the three year picture, which is driving through that big, hairy, audacious goal, whether it's 10 years or five years, it depends on how long you think your leadership team can see around corners. That's really what makes EOS a great operating system because we simplify it down to its smallest parts. So I'm gonna stop there, Donna, and, and see where you wanna go next because that's the big, broad kind of vision VTO. And when teams get the book, they go crazy to do this first, mm -hmm. but as an implementer, when we teach it, it's not where we start. We start with the smallest pieces and build up to this big one. So it's kind of an interesting way to think about somebody who wants to say, yep, yeah, we're going to do EOS. Well, we're going to start with some of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later in this hour. This is great. This is great stuff. And I mean, it, it does. You build a big business plan. And it's pages and pages and pages, and you can lose sight of it so easily. This is nice. Keeps it in front of you nice and simple. Nice and simple. It's electronic. And, and one of the things that, oh, I'll go back up to the second part. Sorry, it didn't show up. I thought it was going to be the next slide. The eight questions, filling out that VTO. The most important mm -hmm. thing here is shared by all. So one of the things that a leader, a visionary in a company will do is every quarter will publish. And sometimes, depending on the type of company, it might hide, some, they might delete the profit number, depending, you know, you could say gross profit, you may not want to say, you know, EBITDA number or something like that. Um, it's shared by all. And again, neuroscience, two facts, pretty well justified. One, it takes seven times to hear something the first time. Doesn't wow. mean you say it seven times in the same meeting, but overall, wow. how we learn, how we learn visually, orally, mm -hmm. Um, experientially and with our, you know, the, we always talk about the various learning abilities that we have. 
um, seven times a year at the first time. The more important piece, which there's still, no one quite agrees on the number, but it's at least 17 times to really get it, to get it in your heart, wow. in, your gut, in your mind. So great to plan, do all this great stuff with the VTO and the leadership does it, but if they don't tell everybody about it, you're not 100% aligned on where you're going. And within teams, and we'll see a little bit better, then you're not 100% aligned on how you're going to get there because this is it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's not 252 pages you put in your drawer. What you do start to do when you, when you put this together, probably three to four months in, in using the traction model, the EOS model, then it starts to help you identify and really um, identify your issues list and the things that the company needs to work on. Okay. So yeah, so tell me a little bit more about that list. That's that's things that are getting in your way. Yeah, you this is you talk this is like we have you know two you know twenty five really great things we're doing for the world for our people, but we've got fifty two issues that are in the way of really accomplishing these goals of accomplishing our ten year heart target of making this impact of having a workforce that is engaged. And, and if you get me on my quiet quitter soapbox, you got to be prepared for me to talk for a while. So we may not want to go there, but it's engagement. It's, you know, kind of a Dan Pink version of meaning, mastery, and autonomy. We are a knowledge-based, we're not, for the most part, we are not a industrial age uh, work, uh, economy anymore. Because you used to be able to tune your car, you hadn't knew how to use a carburetor. Now you need to know how to use a computer. So we're right. going knowledge based for the same kinds of skill sets that we used to have. And when you talk about having to train people up, give them new skill sets, we're training, um, you know, service departments, which is where auto dealerships are making money right now to be computer techs and to be able to understand how to read data. So kind of a sideways to go, but in a knowledge economy, we're really looking for the right people. Mm -hmm. And that's sharing those core values and in the right seats. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the second component, which really is about core values. And we use mm -hmm. this tool called the people analyzers. These core values are the core values of the EOS community, humbly confident. I don't, I sometimes I'm a plus minus in that. Grow or die, always a plus. <laughs> Help first, always a plus. Do the right thing. Yeah, I get there. Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, do what you say. Um, I always keep my promise. If I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to remind you that I made the promise and that I did it. And I'm going to thank you. And you're going to thank me for that. But that's, that's the core value piece. And every company, once they really get into this, understand people in their hearts, why they're here. Simon Sinek, understanding that why, not the what or the how, but that circle, that golden circle, why comes out of your internal core values and that's not something that you can assign there's exercises that we do you know i'm always a pat also a patrick lencioni fan for building trust that trust that trust pyramid great stuff there to really figure out and discover your core values the other and so that's the right people that's jim 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 collins what gino did is he added a piece to it which is now in Jim Collins' new book, I think it's B2.0, called Structure First, People Second. So you go hard on issues, soft on people, hard on issues, human, being human and kind on people. And that really is getting the right person in the right seat in your organization. Not an org chart, not a title, but by mm -hmm. function. Got to sell stuff, got to deliver it, and you got to get people to pay for it so you can pay your people for selling stuff and delivering it. That's every business has these three functions. In the, oh, sorry, in the EOS section, we have somebody who's called an integrator who basically acts maybe as a COO if there's a title associated with it. We try not to get there, but who has the function of really keeping everybody going, having everybody stay focused, kind of pushing the rocket burst activity and really identifying when somebody has that hockey stick activity. And then there's the visionary. And we describe visionaries as squirrels because they, and I am one, bright shiny ball. Yes, bright shiny ball. Every time I go to a conference, take a class, I come back to my company and go, we gotta do this, it's so cool. And they look at me and go, squirrel, squirrel. 
<laughs> um, and it's really a fun way to think about it. But the other thing we do mm -hmm. with the accountability chart in our meetings is we have um, no sacred cows. Everything is on the table all the time. Everything is there for people to discuss, debate, that rigorous debate. And that's building the accountability muscle that goes into this accountability chart. And in wow. right Love seats, it. this is where Gino made the modification, get the right people on the bus. They gotta be in uh -huh. the right seats. Uh -huh. And so what we do in EOS is we have the leadership team really define the seats and the roles, the top five things. LMA stands for lead plus manage equals accountability. It's how we, wow. how we lead the and manage the energy of the people on the team. Because if you're managing too tightly, you probably have the wrong person. And so we build out the accountability chart. And only after the accountability chart is built out within the leadership group, do we assign a name. And it's shocking sometimes when I walk into teams and I say, okay, here's the leadership group. Tell me what you do. Great. What's the role? Let's get there. You're all fired. And they're like, what? what? I'm like, no. We have to know that you actually get it. You get what this seat requires, that you want it. You know, mm -hmm. get it as aptitude and ability. Want it really is passion and capacity mm -hmm. to do it has to do with your energy. All the things going on mm -hmm. in your life, can you give 100%? Because there's never 110. There's actually, we, we are operating usually around 65, 60%. If you're a world-class athlete, you're operating around 90%. When those mm -hmm. athletes dig deep, it's not to 110. There isn't 110. And you can only do that last 10 to 5 to 10% for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. But that's somebody who's really focused on health and well-being. So this is what Gino brought to it in this marketing sale. As a leadership team, we're all going to sit around, again, building accountability, open, honest, vulnerable, really tough the first couple of times. Donna, do you get this seat? Well, and if there's a hesitation, it might be a no. Do you want it? Yeah, I really, really want to do it. Do you have the ability to do it? Well, right now, I might need some time because I'm taking care of my aging parents. And that's taking a lot of time. I'm getting on planes. I'm flying to Wisconsin um, to do their finances every month. So I've got capacity as time and spiritual energy and, and, and just the, the love of the job. Um, and what we're seeing now with quiet quit quitting, and it's a generational thing. I'm a baby boomer. I believe I give 110%. I believe I can dig deep. I believe it's just grit and hanging in. And if it takes me, you know, it makes, makes it feel like I'm only three hours of sleep to get this done, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. My millennials and Gen Xs, no. We want project-based. We want results-driven. We don't, it's not a time clock anymore. I'm not punching in from eight to five. I'm not billing hours anymore. I'm getting you results. And in order to do that, I want to live a different life. And that generational difference is huge right now if, if leadership's not paying attention. And this is where quiet quitting comes in. It's not quiet quitting. It's a really cool marketing thing. It's just disengagement. We've had it forever in the workplace. It's not new. It's been back to the 70s. The percentages haven't changed. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, no, that's a good soapbox. The other thing I was wondering is you talked about entrepreneurialism earlier. I'm wondering if a lot of people are getting out of corporate America and starting businesses instead. In there part a, to get yeah. what you're talking about. The, there's a st statistics coming out of the Federal Reserve and the Department of Labor, new businesses. Million new businesses for those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, um, Spanish speaking. Million new businesses coming out of essentially the Black and African American community, not so much mm. um, in the Native American community. Um, or in the immigrant community, national origin, it's too small, but a million new businesses out of COVID, huge entrepreneurship going on. And the big, the big challenge now, which is something I know, Donna, you're very passionate about, is getting, getting these entrepreneurs the right skills to thrive, to grow their businesses, to talk to banks, to how to hire, how to do all these things, because you've got to get them off their tabletops, their kitchen tops, and build that capacity. Um, however they want to do it, but they've got to actually, you know, get those right people in the right seats and the leadership team. And then you build out the entire organization, function by function, not person by person. 
So that's the second component of right people, right seats. And the next one is data. And data right now um, is, is so important and so available with relatively small expense for even entrepreneurs to go in and make decisions on data, um, to do assessments when they're looking to hire, retain, and onboard, getting people into the right people, core values, right seats, which isn't an EOS function, but there's a lot of good stuff out there that's being developed. Careful on the AI stuff. Um, there's lots of ways to eliminate bias. It's still there, it exists, bias is never going away. The, ob the object is to make unconscious bias conscious, to interrupt those triggers and have those systemic checks that we go back and say, hmm, when we look our, at our statistics, overall we get 100 resumes and 70% 70 of, 70 of the ones that make it through are white men. Well, there's probably a bias there someplace. 60% um, have college degrees probably a bias there someplace. So we've got to examine our results when we use technology to, to hire, to find um, talent, but it's there. And in the EOS model, when we go inside the company, what we're really talking about is a weekly scorecard. Mm -hmm. That if you as the founder or CEO, take your best vacation, safari in Africa, beach in Belize, um, just, away from the world and in, in the mountains of Thailand, whatever that is, you could spend 15 minutes a week looking at your scorecard, looking at your trends and knowing you're okay. So it's the big things. And what we want to do with scorecards is we want to have looking at those forward looking activities that tell us we're doing the right things that we're gonna achieve our 90 day goals, our 90 day metrics. And so the cool thing about company scorecards, again, electronic shouldn't take more than 20 minutes to build every week. You can say last 13 weeks, oh yeah, that's about 90 days. How cool is that? I can see the trends. And sometimes it's heavy on financial, sometimes it's heavy on sales, but at the leadership, at the company level, it's those, are we doing the right things? Airline pilots, you know, they go on automatic pilot. They're only on actually exactly on course about 5% of the time. There's constant course correction, winds, clouds, other traffic. Same thing with companies. And what a scorecard does, and it takes about six to eight months to get it right, it really helps you see your goals. They have the measurables, some forward looking, um, tells us we're doing the right things. And if there's an issue, we can make an adjustment before the end of the quarter. We don't make our rocks, we don't make our goals, and it, and it puts the year at end. The other thing that we say is that everyone in the organization has a number. And here's the equity lens that comes in when we talk about data, meaning mastery autonomy. Everybody has to know how, how what they do, what I do makes a difference, adds value. My voice is heard. I'm here for a reason. It goes back to that golden circle why. And if you think about what gets measured gets done, this is, I think Buffett is probably most credited for that since the seventies, then everybody knows that there's, again, we're building that muscle of accountability. I matter, I have a number and we do it throughout mm -hmm. the organization. Mm -hmm. So that gets you data, which is, mm -hmm. I mean, so easy to collect now and so much fun to slice and dice. And if you like technology and you're a data geek, I'm not, um, I reverse numbers too often. Um, it's really a great way to get people really excited. And we tell a story um, that is kind of 20th century, not 21st century about um, pouring aluminum in a manufacturing plant in, in uh, Pennsylvania, I think it is. And every shift would get so many pours. And they were like, well, productivity is falling. So the, the floor manager took a big old piece of that chalk, the kind that kids use on the sidewalk, and put a number, draw a circle around it. That's how many, they did 70 pours that shift. Next shift comes in, and what's this number? Well, that's what the, what the prior shift, pour, that's how many pours they had. They're spitting on it and covering it up. They said, we're doing, we're going to do more than seven. So they finish their shift and they do eight. 
that number goes up. Third shift comes in. And what we've done is we've thought about the value we bring. And then once they got to a point of what we would call um, just that top, then it was not only number of pours, then we got a safety pit, safety piece. How many days mm -hmm. per shift, no OSHA violations, no accidents. And so you start mm -hmm. to build this culture of I matter. We matter as a team. And that's where data is so important in, in entrepreneurial uh, organizations. Um, the next, the fourth is issues. And this is the most, I think the most difficult. And when you talked about that issue list, Donna, mm -hmm. this is where all those imperfections and uh, gee, I wish we didn't. And boy, we spent a million dollars trying to build a staffing company and COVID hit and we didn't pivot fast enough. Ouch. Um, we didn't get rid of that toxic em employee fast enough. Ouch. But that's where issues come in. And we call it the issue solving track, IDS. And the most important thing here is to identify the issue. And this is root cause. And you got to peel away the la layers of the onion before you get to that discussion. And as former, I, I think, as WPO chapter chairs, clarifying mm -hmm. questions, teaching your team to say, not did you talk to the lawyer, what did you do next? Well, mm -hmm. you know, did you, what did the accountant say? How have you communicated with, have you, who have you communicated with? What did the accountant say? All those clarifying questions to identify the issue because you've got the most important value of, of, of leadership at the company all sitting at a table. You get all points of the compass. And then again, that's where team starts to build. Well, if you do that, that affects me over here in operations. So customer experience and sales and marketing and how are we delivering? Because if you're selling something I'm not delivering, we're in trouble <laughs> often where it comes up. And what we do in terms of our weekly meeting is we tackle one issue at a time, identify it, get it done to its root cause. And oftentimes you'll see somebody's body language change. When you get to that root cause, it's like, oh yeah, that's it. I thought it was this, but it's that. Most of the time, it's a people of process issue. Most of the time. And we'll talk about process in a minute. Then it's discussion. What, how does this affect? Go ahead, Donna. No, I was going to ask you, and Nan's got some questions too, but um, getting at the root cause, is there a methodology you use to help people do that? Yeah. And, in, and, um, and it's, you know, I think the, the most fun is, is you, keep, you kind of do the five whys, which is an exercise mm -hmm. that's all over YouTube. They did it with the Washington Monument. Why is the... You know, why is the monument being destroyed? Well, it's bird poop, blah, blah. Why is, why is there bird poop? Well, birds sit there, they put up all those little things to keep the bird poop going away. And what they figured out ultimately in that five Y exercise, it's the lights at night that attract the birds that stay warm. And so they show up there. And so they changed uh -huh. the, just kind of the value of the lights that, sh that light it up at night. And that slowed down the degeneration of the Washington Monument. That's the most famous. It's they're all over YouTube, but if you go five whys, uh, root cause, many, many different examples for different industries, different manufacturers. But it really is, again, really simple. Just and really, really, you know, say the stuff that's hard to say. If you think it, say it. That in you know, identify awesome. the issue is just the hardest thing to do early on. But as teams build that accountability muscle, they build that trust muscle, they have that vigorous debate. It's tension, it's conflict. You got to get used mm -hmm. to conflict's okay. Mm -hmm. But once you have that conflict, if the process was fair, if everybody had an opportunity to be heard and, and voice their opinions, then you get to commitment. And you kind of like, all right heard everything, we're gonna make a decision. Here's the decision. Can you get behind it 100%? Yes, I can. And you need those kind of hell yes answers. And if somebody's not a hell yes, you're not done. So Nan, I'm sorry, I, I, I let me look in the chat. Uh, who creates a scorecard? Um, that usually is a product of the leadership team and the integrator who kind of champions most of these tools. Um, but it should be, you know, we do it in uh, Excel. On a, in our company, there are tools out there that EOS One um, has provided. There are other cottage industry providers that set up all the data for you, but it's the leadership team that keeps working on it. And once the leadership team gets the company scorecard, then when you get a little bit further in process, you're gonna the leadership team and every leader in that function piece is gonna take the same tools 
and do it with each of their divisions, their departments, their teams. Uh, was there another one there? Let's see. Yeah, yeah, she's talking about the the plight of women in their fifties are losing job opportunities to younger people. Um, too too old on that side, too young to retire on the other side. Is there a company awareness of this? And if so, what are they doing about it? Back to your diversity equity. Yeah, um, all of that is true, and mm -hmm. there are companies who are going to say we don't care. Um, there are companies who are going to really put their, I guess, their money, um, they're going to evaluate their leadership, their comps, whether they're privately owned or publicly traded. But that equity and inclusion piece, getting to not diversity of numbers as much, because we think about that when we teach diversity, equity, and inclusion, we actually teach it backwards. You got to create a great culture first. That's the inclusion. As everybody know, they value, they belong, they've seen, they heard, they matter, they matter. Equity is the systemic change, um, the policy, procedures, manuals, recruiting tools, where bias lives. And if you do those two things right, and it's about a three-year journey. Mm -hmm. The diversity, the mix of diversity of thought, happens, and um, we are seeing. You know, recent economic statistics talked about this. I was listening to something yesterday, and I won't be able to remember what it was. But we are seeing basically um, at the baby boomer level, most people are tapping out. We're going to retire. We're going to do something else. Um, I often talk, talk, think about if I ever stop teaching, I'm going to go work at Whole Foods or UPS because I like both those stores. And I, I love getting presents. So delivering packages would be cool. And then I found out you just don't get to start at UPS to drive a truck, which would be really fun. Um, the, the, the next group, um, which would be Gen Y, um, are not tapping out. And some of it is this idea that the baby boomers have to get out of the way, but organizations are gonna take a little bit of time to figure out that uh, in a hybrid workplace, those 50 something workers, regardless of their um, big eight identities are the most value there is. And they don't have to cost a lot. The, the younger gen, gen X's, millennials, they're gonna cost a whole bunch more. And mo many business owners who are in their 50s and 60s are gonna have a hard time figuring out how to speak with them because they're not doing the culture stuff. And it's all about that culture. Um, mm. So, you know, to say, yeah, but, there's some, we're a knowledge economy. The, the GDP in the United States is really built on uh, probably about 90% of privately owned businesses, entrepreneurs. That's what drives mm -hmm. our economy. And we're starting mm -hmm. to make stuff again here. Um, and the more that we can think about how do we understand our why and do it in a healthy well-being way because that's going to be more important than anything else for the next two to five years is addressing the long-term effects of being at home not just getting sick but truly being at home coming back into the workplace trying to figure out what we're doing in the economy with the recession looking at the possibility of a, a, a big war in europe don't know where any of that's going um, people are still standing in place because it's too hard. And I think, but that's why um, Darwin gets quoted all the time. Oh yeah, it's the, the, the fittest, the strongest, which will survive. It's not actually what he said. First, he was studying animals, not humans. But second, more importantly, what he found, it's adaptability. Mm -hmm. it's the ability to deal with change that helps you survive and thrive. And I think we have to rethink, especially those of us who are um, baby boomers, we have to really rethink what it mean, what, what, what does it mean to do well at work now? I don't know. That's, you know, kind of, again, we can, we'll go sideways a lot of times, but that's, that's the kinds of things that I think entrepreneurs have to think about. And the thing that makes um, EOS so successful here is really getting into what's your target market? You know, and again, um, somebody really fun to follow on marketing and target marketing, Seth Godin. Get on his, oh, his yeah. emails every day. He's had a couple this week about is better, faster, bigger, really bad. 
And how do you reinvent what you used to sell when you started? He had a great, great um, blog two, a couple days ago about as a startup, the immediate interest is really cool. And then everything cools off because you now you found your early adopters. You found your champions. Now you got to go convince people who are kind of like, yeah, I'm not sure. And you have to reinvent how you talk about your product or your service in that respect. Um, two more to go in the model that we just I'll kind of keep pushing to because process is new and there's a new book on process by Mike Payton, um, who is one of the early, early EOS implementers. He's one of the guys that I trained under and really to simplify, document and simplify. Because what we do know is that 20% of the work that you do of any company produces 80% of the results. And as we're going, I, I was Mm -hmm. um, at a quarterly meeting of a company um, that's in, in the transportation industry, logistics, they had their best year last year. And it's September, the cliff, the bottom dropped out, and they're going to have their worst year ever. And one of the things they had to do is apply this 2080 rule and say, we have to get what we call heavy dollars. When we, when we collect a dollar, we want to get 50, 60%. So we're really talking margins. It's the lawyer's way of talking about margin. Mm -hmm. We want to get 60, 70% of that dollar back, not 10 or 20. So we've got to go through the work that we're doing and, and do work that's going to produce those heavy dollars, a bigger return. And when you look at it that way, you could cut off the bottom 10, 15% of your clients and customers and the ones who bellyache and always ask for more and you would be more productive, more efficient, and have higher margins. Huh. So yeah, this is where, this is why Donna, when you say, you know, you talk about business, it's like, yeah, here's the system. Now let me tell you why it works. Um, <laughs> every business, just like we have these three operations, marketing, sales, operations, finance, you can have a handful of core processes. And it even works with big, you know, 200,000 employee companies, but it really is this. You've got a people process, You've got uh, how do we attract customers? How do we close a deal? How do we deliver our product and services? How do we keep our clients happy? So on that IBM sales ladder, we have same clients doing the same thing, but we get them buying more. Or we have the same client maybe doing an adjacent thing, and we get them to buy that too. And if, if a business owner is focused on those two pieces of that IBM sales ladder, ladder you're growing. Because getting a different customer to buy the same service, take, it's long and hard and expensive. But when we're going into this recession, which we're going, you know, people say, no, it's not. Yeah, it, it is. It doesn't matter. Prices are going up. Um, unemployment's mm -hmm. going to go up. It, it's just what we're headed. How long? Who knows? But you've got to pay attention to the people who are buying right now. The ones who are in your stores, in your websites, buying stuff. Give them value. Um, I don't say drop prices. In fact, many people have to increase prices. That's just where recession is. But give them, the, give them attention, please, mm -hmm. and thank you. Huge. And people don't do it. They're too disconnected. Mm -hmm. And so when we just like the VTO, just two pages, your um, standard operating processes would be eight or ten. Here's basically everybody needs this. You document them, you simplify to the top five to seven activities. Did you go through these steps? Because, and this is um, a quote from the former CEO of the Four Seasons. If you systemize the predictable, you can humanize the exceptional. Ah spectacular and processes mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. systemize the predictable it's Ross rinse re repeat as a leadership team or as a functional leader now you've just freed up time to give attention to your to your employees to your customers to your shareholders to your leadership think about all the all the stakeholders in that ecosystem that if you aren't solving a problem for everybody who walks into your office I need five minutes of your time 30 minutes later, you're going, I just got lost 30 minutes. I'll never get back. So we're trying to use process to free up time, give you more freedom to humanize mm. that exceptional experience within the business ecosystem. Mm. And so then you get this, your company way. And again, just like the VTO was shared by all, we have the process followed by all. Mm. 
And to do that, you can't just do a process. Here's the process, knock yourself up. Thanks very much, go team, woo. No, <laughs> it's training and it's measuring metrics. Remember data, every team will have their metrics. Are we doing it the same way? Because if you're doing it the same way and everybody's coming together in these weekly meetings, you can say, oh, this is working better. I'm not doing it like that. I'm gonna do that too. So you start doing more of what's working, building on people's strengths, less than less than and spending less time on what's not working. And it also helps you identify your underperformers faster. LMA is lead, manage, and accountability. We do a whole thing about how to be a great boss. And then you update your processes because things change and you learn. And so there's this continuous learning loop with this followed by all checklist. Uh, we're coming home now. Oh, look at that. There's some animation in it. And so once you get this process documented, followed by all, now all of a sudden you can identify where there's gaps, where we can upgrade. And here, one of the things you're looking for, both in the process component and the people component, is really important. Don't give feedback. People go, what? No, really, don't give feedback. Give advice and recommendations. Look forward, not backwards. Mm -hmm. Feedback is a critique. It tells you what you did wrong. And we mm -hmm. want to make a distinction there, again, to build this high-performing team, this culture. Advice, hey, you got the results. I want to have a conversation. What would you do differently? How do you upgrade? Mm -hmm. How do we upgrade it for your teammates? And there's a conversation that comes out of that curiosity that team leaders have to have, not saying, hey, I've done this a million times, you didn't do it right. Here's, here's, here's how I've done it for the last, anytime I hear somebody say, yeah, this is the way we've done it for the last 15 years, I go, that's a company that's dying. Uh, I'm curious uh, about what's growing, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then we get down to what we call the traction, living in this 90 day world. And this is a Stephen Covey, um, animation when I didn't put the animation in, but you have this clear jar. This is the 100%. There isn't 110%. Once you get up to the top, it's, it's not in there anymore. And if you do this, um, all the water pitchers missing, sorry, that's part of the visual of the animation. But if you have rocks, pebbles, sand, and water, rocks are the really important things you got to do. Pebbles, are mostly the things that come up on a database basis. They're part of your task, but they don't rise to a rock level. Sand is email for me and calendaring, it's horrific. Mm -hmm. And water's the rest of your life. The only way you're gonna get all four of those things into this jar is by putting the rocks in first, taking care mm -hmm. of those, then the pebbles, mm -hmm. then the sand, then the water, it fits. And sometimes the water pours over, it means you're overcommitted. But that's the 100%. And so with Stephen Covey, and again, great, great um, YouTube videos on this concept. Uh, I think mostly they call them rocks, pebbles, sand. You really want to get a weekly practice, the meeting pulse, level 10 weekly meetings with your leadership team, with your departments. And we call them level 10 because we want to rate them at the end of the meeting. Like, did we give it our best? Was it a 10? A 10 for today, not for a 10 forever. And, and it's not a grade. It's just... How did I show up? And what was I present? Was I participating? And sometimes it's not. Quarterly meetings going over your annual rocks, annual planning to, do, to update your VTO. And every meeting is, this is for those of you who are from Minnesota, sorry, I'm a lifelong Packers fan, all those in Illinois, Chicago Bears, Vince Lombardi. You start on time, you end on time, you have the same agenda every meeting, early is on time, and on time is late. But that, again, building that accountability, even for your squirrels. Because leaders think, oh, you know, sorry, I was just five minutes late. Doesn't count. And you don't interrupt the meeting. You come in, you sit down, you be quiet. You just catch up later. Mm -hmm. And we have the same agenda for your weekly meeting. Good news. It's a segue. Tell me your, best in, your, your business and prof professional best in the last week. Scorecard review. Is it on? Is it off? If it's off, we drop it down to the issues list. Rock review, on track, off track, off track. Do we need to drop it down or are you okay? No, I want to drop it down. I want to hear what you have to say about what's going on. I got to get caught up. Employee customer headlines. And then your to-do lists, which come out of the decisions you made in your issues, uh, your IDS session, which is the 60 minutes. Those to-dos are how do we activate 
the decisions we made about an issue because issues aren't done discussing, you haven't found it, if, if you don't have a decision. And so as a leadership team, this is what we're doing. Everybody been system, you know, process was fair, yep, everybody's seen and heard, yep, here's the decision. Can you live with it, even if you don't agree? Yes, hell yes, I commit, because I'm part of this team. And then you conclude five minutes, communication issues, uh, cascading messages for those who weren't there, and you rate the meeting one through 10, 10 being best. It's not a grade like school. You can't say, I never give A's. Because if I say I never give A's and I give you an eight, is that your top score you'll ever give? Yeah, okay, great, I'm converting that to a 10. Sorry, that's the system, you don't get to change it. Your personal views about grading, don't care. This is about the company. Hmm. And that really gets us through the entire system. And you can see as we talk through today, how each component and each tool affects how every business runs. I think it's magic. I think Gino Whitman was brilliant. I think he had no idea how cool this was, but it's now 20 years plus. You can put an equity lens over this and make it work and it's gonna be universal. So I always thank him for his pa paper and pencil, his pad, his clarity breaks that he sat down and tried to figure this stuff out over 20 years ago and then got a system in which he wrote a book which still works. So I'll stop oh, there in a few more tough. minutes. And uh, how, just, I guess, well, I guess anyway, here's, here's what you got to think about as a business owner. This is really what you're trying to do. I don't care what the industry is, where you are in the country, in the world. Got to have fun. You got to smile. You got to tell jokes. You got to be willing to say, oh, I, let me tell you this funny story. You got to have a sense of self so that you can have a sense of humor. We talk about this a lot. It's um, working on the business, not in the business. Mm -hmm. Understand how, you know, we say, yeah, we got to work smarter, not harder. Yeah, and we got to work healthy. Well-being, not being overtaxed, not being burned out, having a culture that people are engaged. And they, these are the tools, the practical tools that if they're implemented, you know, we saw the six key, key components and then two tools for each key component. If you really implement it, this is what you would see. And that's why we try to teach entrepreneurs. So there's a bunch. Yeah, you got to learn finance. Yeah, you got to understand tech. You got to figure out who's going to do your marketing and sales. As a business owner, you got to have a process, a system that tells people where you want to go, 100% aligned behind your vision and how you're going to get there, such that um, everybody starts to feel like, hey, we created a really cool team. We are doing this together. And that loneliness, I think that especially women CEOs, um, CEOs of color feel as they start to develop um, their village, not just of their peers, but their village of their company. That's where culture lives. And that's, that's the coolest part about what I get to do. So I'll stop there and we'll just kind of hold. Very powerful. This, is, this has been amazing. I, we could go on for hours. This is really great. And we've learned so much from you. Um, let's see here. I want to, we're right at time. So I want to give you a chance to just talk briefly about what you do and how they reach you. Anything you want to say about your business? Yeah, I think if you, if you, you know, you publish Nancy Gein and EOS Worldwide for EOS stuff, I, because I'm a franchise, we are a franchise, I'm a franchisee, everything goes kind of through their stuff. Um, I don't, because I was mostly talking about EOS and I like the kind of the cleanness of it. Um, the best place to get a hold of me is LinkedIn, honestly, and it's N J G E E N E N LinkedIn. That's it's just my Nancy Josephine Geenan, N J Geenan, because um, that tells you more about what flexibility does, what we're doing around culture and team training. But um, a lot of what we do, even when we're not doing EOS implementation, is taking some of these same concepts and saying, "This is how you build a high performance team." This is. And I'm also certified in talent optimization, predictive index, and Colby, and all that other stuff. But, but it's really about, um, as a leader, just staying curious and, and really being open to this continuous, continuous learning loop. Superpowers. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nancy. This has been My terrific. Pleasure. It's exactly what we needed. Um, and uh, I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you again.
Thank you both. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, just a reminder, guys, we do this every uh, Friday at 10 Central. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers coming up. I've uh, pulled off the books off my bookshelf that I find most useful, and I've reached out to the authors, and they're all coming on over the next couple of weeks. So stay with us, and please remember, purse power, we have it. Let's use it. All right. Thank you so much. Have a Thank great you. rest of the day. Take care. Bye.